Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Library of Mistakes. If you haven't been to the Library of Mistakes before, I'll just briefly explain what it is and how you use it. You can probably see it's a, it's a library of business and financial history mainly, and we are here to help move finance beyond the decimal point. Uh, that's been a long-term struggle, and it continues. The way you use this library is you register as a reader on our website, which is libraryofmistakes.com, and then you arrange a visit, and you will be buzzed in. And we are open 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to, Monday to Saturday. If you do, you'll also be notified about the, uh, these events that we're doing here. Uh, the live streams that come from here, the recordings of the events, and the podcasts. So that's the upside. It is, before you ask, free. We are a charity. It is a public library. We're here tonight to discuss my book. I've never done a presentation at the Library of Mistakes before, actually, which is given that we launched in 2014. I was always not doing one in case somebody missed their flight, and then I was going to jump in and do it. But uh, I've been, COVID gave me a chance to write a book, so I sort of wrote, wrote a book instead. And this is it, and it's a book about something that I was involved with called the Asian Financial Crisis. And that is seen really as a footnote in history by most people, but I'm here to suggest to you that it shouldn't be a footnote, that it set the scene, it set the foundations, it built the financial architecture that created where we are today. And that's going to be the conclusion uh, of this presentation, is how it took us there. But there are many people in this room who were there who experienced this as well. So it will also be about the stock market, how, why the stock market fell, why the stock market boomed. Uh, so if you're only here to get uh, tips on how to invest in the stock market, hopefully there'll be a few of those as well. So let's begin with what it was. It began, well, most people think it began with the devaluation of the Thai baht on the 2nd of July, 1997. That's where it's dated to. I'm starting before that. I'm going to start when the market peaks which was in the previous summer, and we're talking, when I say market, I'm talking stock market, and it ends in September uh, 1998, which is when the stock market bottoms and, and starts to go up. If you had bought the MSCI Asia X Japan Index, which is the most professional investors were using that as their benchmark, and you bought it and held it from the peak to the bottom in 1998, you lost 70% of all your money. So that's quite a lot. Uh, but yet not really remembered. Remember the Great Depression, you probably lost about 90% of your money and you didn't lose that much of your British equities. So this was a big thing if you were an investor and that was the aggregate for the index. If you bought the Thai stock market and held it from its peak to its trough, you lost 89% of all your money. Now that is very similar to the Great Depression and yet who knows about it? And frankly, who cares? You might think, well, who cares really? Because this is volatility and we love volatility because you know, who cares if it goes up and down as long as it goes up in the long term. So let me give you the number for the MSCI index as of 1994. And this was in the, I think it was the very first trading day of 1994. So remember the MSCI index is the equity index of Thailand in dollar terms. And the index was 655 in 1994. And when I checked it this morning, it's at 520. <laughs> so that's a 28-year holding period. Uh, now, obviously, you, you receive dividends, and if you reinvest the dividends, you've done somewhat better. So this was not a temporary thing. It had a permanent impact uh, on the wealth of those who were investing there, uh, and it's lingered uh, with them. Now, there were great opportunities to buy at the bottom, uh, and I was lucky enough to write about that. But that is something about the Asian financial crisis. But I want to put it into a broader context. Uh, and I am going to read a lot from my own book. That's a luxury. Bear with me. Uh, which I hope this puts it into the broader context, which I think is really important way beyond finance uh, into something much bigger and the clash of cultures that is with us today and will be with us, sadly, for the rest, at least the rest of this century, I suspect. The end of the so-called Asian economic miracle and the events of the Asian financial crisis were about much more than money. They were about a conflict between, between very different societies fought on the battleground of capital markets. It was the first major battle in a war that continues to this day and will shape the rest of the 21st century. 
It is a war that was instigated by a Thatcher Reagan revolution that launched a new form of capitalism that sought to change the world armed with excessive amounts of debt in the pursuit of profit. While initially it looked like an old form of what we might call laissez-faire capitalism, it very quickly became a new form of capitalism, probably best labelled financial capitalism. It was a form of capitalism that combined individualism with the aggressive use of balance sheet management for primarily personal profit. The rise of financial capitalism occurred as the Berlin Wall, Berlin Wall fell and communism collapsed. It was widely assumed that the rest of the world would adapt to a capitalist system and the new financial capitalism itself with a seeming myriad of opportunities for profit and it was argued only weak competition. The fact that many stock markets across the world closed primarily by communist regimes had reopened was a signal that the change to a more capitalist structure was underway. However, these were dangerous surface signals because in many societies, the new form of capitalism spreading from the US was incompatible with local societal beliefs and structures. Each society in Asia was different in its own way. But in North Asia in particular, there was a much more communal approach to societal organization that could not and has not been reconciled with financial capitalism. This book charts the battle between the new financial capitalism and the various other forms of capitalism that existed then and still exist across Asia. So at the peak of this, this crisis, I attended a conference in Bali. These are the joys of living in Asia, uh, where I was speaking to a group of multinational corporations from America, and they were salivating and licking their lips because they could see cheap assets, now obviously quite encumbered by debt, but cheap assets, but they kept going on about how this was a victory for Anglo-Saxon capitalism over Asian capitalism. How none of these guys knew the first thing about business, how crony capitalism was about to be dead, and how they were about to wipe the whole thing out. Now, it didn't actually work out that way. And that's where we'll get to the synthesis that developed really through exchange rate manipulation by Asia, but particularly in North Asia. And my thesis, and has been since 1998, is that there wouldn't be a victory for one system over the other but there would be a fusion and a merger, and we would come to a, an agreement, or not an agreement, but we would come to a system, actually, where our system will look more like their system. Uh, and that is, I think, where we're going to, to rapidly. So why have a library of mistakes, and why talk about something that happened so long ago? I think the best description uh, of why we talk about financial history comes from J.K. Galbraith, who's one of the best, most eloquent writers in the, in the English language, never mind in financial history. Braith is a, a, is a wonderful turn of phrase. And in the uh, preface to the 1975 edition of his uh, famous The Great Crash, 1929, he wrote this. The story of the boom and crash of 1929 is worth telling for its own sake. Great drama joined in those months with a luminous insanity. But there is some more somber purpose. As protection against financial illusion or insanity, memory is far better than law. When memory of the 1929 disaster failed, law and regulation no longer sufficed. For protecting people from the cupidity of others and their own, history is highly utilitarian. And that is why we're here. Uh, but I particularly like the phrase luminous insanity. And that is why I'm gonna start the story slightly before the collapse and tell you something uh, about the forms of luminous insanity that were underway in Asia at the time. It goes without saying that virtually nobody recognized these as insanity, luminous or otherwise. Uh, they were called the Asian economic miracle. Uh, and it came as a great shock when it turned out actually that it was insanity. When I went to Asia, I came to the conclusion that it's gonna to come to an end. So I want to begin with what I saw then as the fundamental flaw in the system turned out to be the fundamental flaw in the system. It was evident to everybody. It was in publicly released data. Uh, I think it bears some use for the future as well, the structural problem uh, that was there throughout. Uh, once again, I'll read from the, from the book. The new reality of the Asian economic miracle seemed to me to be already rest on some very shaky foundations. The fundamental reason why it could not be sustained was because the region's current accounts were already in significant deficit and the ability to maintain stable exchange rates and produce higher levels of economic growth thus relied upon ever larger capital flows. 
while every ever larger capital inflows were possible, the deterioration in the quality of those inflows already visible in the form of ever larger sums of short-term capital inflows and less long-term capital inflows suggested that it was increasingly dangerous to bet on their continuation. As the Asian economic miracle story took hold, a larger and larger proportion of the capital flowing to Asia was for the purchase of liquid equities, the local currency bond markets being virtually non-existent in 1995. This inflow of capital for the purchase of liquid investments was very different from foreign direct investment, investment that primarily ended up in bricks, mortar and machinery, or in some other form of productive capacity. Money flowing in for the purchase of equities was at least in theory highly liquid and could leave as quickly as it arrived. FDI funds could flow quickly. They could not could flow, flow in quickly, but they took the form of usually physical capital and the rapid exodus was highly unlikely. So what was going on here is that most, if not all, of these Asian authorities were managing their currencies relative to the United States dollar. And that meant that they were intervening in the, in the uh, foreign exchange markets every day. And if there were more buyers than sellers of their currency at the managed exchange rate, they just printed more of it. But if there would ever be less buying than selling, they'd have to destroy it. So they had handed this over to the capital markets to determine, much as we did when we joined the exchange rate mechanism, much as Greece did when it joined the, the euro. It did exactly the same thing. But nobody could conceive of a time when they wouldn't buyers than sellers of these currencies. There had recently been a crisis in Mexico, and the Asian currencies went that really very well. So the fact that they had huge current account deficits that had to be funded by every day by capital to keep the currency stable and the economy growing was thought to be not even worth commenting on because, of course, that foreign capital would come. So for me, the vulnerability was there, but that's irrelevant in terms of when. Uh, but the growing vulnerability was coming because there was less and less foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investors weren't saying that this capacity was cheap and productive because they were turning up less and less, and it was more about portfolio investors. Now this book is called The Asian Financial Crisis, but I think we all know, most people in this room are investment professionals, that what we call Asia, America, or Europe is actually what's in the stock market index. The market index isn't always what you tell your clients you've come to buy. So let me tell you what Asia was. Asia, Pakistan, to Japan, as far south as India. This was the weightings of the index that the fund managers were pouring money into in the third quarter of 1996. Of Asia, that world of, uh, well, it's billions of people, 25% of all the money went to Hong Kong, which was this tiny little island hanging off the bottom of, of China. 19% of all the money went to Malaysia. 13% went to Singapore, another uh, tiny island. 10% went to Taiwan, India over a billion people even then, 7% going into that. Thailand, 7%, North Korea, 7%, Indonesia, huge country, 130 million people at that stage, 7%, Philippines, 4%, China, not 6%. And we were bringing money from the developed world savers and telling them we were investing in Asia. And 57% of it was going into Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Singapore. Not only that, if you looked at the composition of these indices, they were full of banks and property companies. So we told everybody we were buying into the growth story of Asia, but actually we were investing in the banks and property companies of Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Singapore. Of course, the marketing was good. I mean, Asia was growing. Why wouldn't everything go up? But one of the lessons of financial history, it's what you in that counts, and we were investing in these stocks. Now, we were actually changing the fundamentals for these stocks as... Uh, investment professionals know there's a theory called reflexivity, theory put forward by George Soros. And Soros uh, refutes standard financial theory. Standard financial theory says that the price of a security will reflect the fundamentals. And Soros points out that in some occasions, rarely but on some occasions, the security prices change the fundamentals. And this was the classic example of it. Because the more money we put in to buy these shares, the more money the central bank had to print. The more we tried to drive up the valuation of the exchange rate by constantly buying it to buy the equities, the only way they could stop it going up was to create more of it. And guess which businesses in any economy do really well when you print a lot of money? Banks and property companies. 
which was listed on the stock market. So we were actually changing the fundamentals of this. So we changed the fundamentals of how money was created uh, and that created one hell of a boom. And lots of the banks were growing their balance sheets at 30% or more per annum and this was considered to be perfectly normal. Now I've never been a banker but I wouldn't like to go out every morning and try to find 30% good credits more than I'd find the day before. But that is a rule of banking that is a, a fairly iron rule that it's pretty impossible to keep doing that and at some stage you run out of good credits. So there was a lot of bad credit uh, flying around in Asia at this time. There were other ways to make money from Asia. As I said, this index really didn't do very well. People who wanted to invest in Asia insisted in buying Asian equities, but they should have been buying Louis Vuitton. There were other ways to do this. Uh, I wrote something in May 1996, uh, which covered this. What you should have done with your money in 1996 if you wanted to make money out of Asia. Now this relates to wine, and I have friends in the audience who know that I know absolutely nothing about wine. But I took advice from somebody who did, and I wrote this in 1996 about how to make money out of investing in Asia. The power of the brand name in Asia is well documented, and Chinese consumers account for more than 50% of the world's cognac consumption. But who knows why? Anecdotal evidence suggests that the Hong Kong consumer is discovering shea associated with fine wine. Asian demand produces a dual positive for old or wine. Unbelievable Asian purchasers buy this for consumption, ag aggravating the supply shrinkage. Long-serving gold bugs curse the name Paul Volcker. Gold prices can go down as well as up. However, should wine prove an unsuccessful investment, there is solace to be found at the bottom of every bottle. <laughs> CLSA's 1995 en primaire top tipples are Mouton Rothschild, Latour, and Pichon Lalande. And when I wrote this book and published it last year, here are the performance statistics <laughs> for the Napier Wine Index. An investor buying a case of 1995 Mouton Rothschild or Latour has seen the value of their investment increase tenfold. The investor in 1995 Pichon Lalande has to be content with just an eightfold increase on their investment. The Asian miracle, the Asian demand boom, there were lots of ways to play that in all corners of the planet. One thinks of Queensland, for instance, and Brisbane as another great way to play it. Uh, and it turned out to be better than playing it through the equities. Uh, when I was a young man here in Edinburgh, the first Chinese stock came to the market in February 1992. And I went to the roadshow in the Caledonian because there was a free lunch. There are free lunches in Broking. Maybe. And uh, these companies were very bad. I mean, they come straight out of the state-run sector. But Morgan Stanley created an index anyway, the MSCI China Index. The MSCI China Index in 1992 and today, does anybody want to guess what that has got to? Yes, you're right, it's down. <laughs> 1992 to 2022, the MSCI Index in US dollar terms is down. Not up. Now, once again, there were dividends to reinvest. But we all know what's happened to the Chinese economy over that period. You should have bought Mouton Rothschild. You'd have made 10 times your money. There is more than one way to skin a cat. Now, overlying this problem in Asia was not just us, if you like, the investors who were pouring money into the equity market. There were bankers. There are always bankers. It's hard to think of a boom and a bust that there isn't a banker involved in. Uh, and these bankers were lending foreign currency. And, and that was really at the heart of why this became such a huge crisis. Because so many Asian corporations and even Asian individuals had borrowed dollars. So if you were living down in Indonesia, and I'm doing this from memory now, I think you could, if you wanted to borrow Indonesian rupiah, you probably paid about 15%. But in those days, dollar yields were a bit higher, but you could probably go and borrow dollars at 5 or 6%. And everybody knew that the Indonesian rupiah could not fall against the dollar. Of course it couldn't, because for years and years, They've been holding it down, and for years and years, the foreign exchange reserves have been going up, telling you that they were actually undervaluing it. It was clearly an undervalued exchange rate. So people went out, and they borrowed in US dollars. And those numbers became astronomical. And the really embarrassing thing is that nobody really noticed. And I say really embarrassing, because I worked there for a bank called CLSA, which was a bank. And CLSA was lending lots of these dollars in Asia, but I didn't know they were lending lots of these dollars in Asia. 
and my competitors were working for banks like Deutsche Bank and other banks, and they didn't know, so we were in two different floors of the building. The analysts were sitting in one floor of the building with no knowledge whatsoever that the corporations had got this huge mismatch on the balance sheet, and one floor up, they were doing massive uh, loan documentation and, and learning all this money. So it is a lesson to try to break down the silos between debt and equity, and I think as many professional investors know, we're still struggling to do that. Uh, and quite often there's something really extreme happening in the debt side of the balance sheet uh, that we just were not very aware of. It's supposed to be revealed in the accounts, but I never discovered any analyst who worked out that these huge amounts of dollar debt were going on. Now, one of the, the problems with this was that uh, quite a lot of this was lent by Japanese banks. Now, for those who know their financial history, you will know the Japanese stock market peaked in 1990, 1989 and it was coming down, and the deflation in those assets was causing greater and greater problems in the Jap for the Japanese banks. But in the first four to five years, they just kept lending anyway. Now, they lent some yen into Asia, uh, but they also lent a lot of dollars. They didn't take dollar deposits, but they could access those, access those through the euro markets. They would take dollars over here, and they would lend them into Asia over here. And that was part of that great capital going in. But what we didn't understand at the time was just how bad the balance sheets of these Japanese banks were becoming. And not only that, the yen was falling, much as it is today, and not at a dissimilar pace. And suddenly, the value of these dollar loans were going up, and the value of their domestic capital was going down. Now, if you're a banker in that situation, you might have to pull in your assets, because the value in yen in terms of your assets is going up, and because of write-offs, your capital is going down. And that's what began to happen. And we can get the linkage the Japanese banking system and this flow of capital into Asia, which we sort of understood had happened, but the fact that the tide was turning around was something that people had noticed, including the competitors of the Japanese banks who willingly stepped in to their place, at least initially, uh, and particularly European banks. Uh, American banks were a little bit more sanguine uh, about all of this. Meanwhile, enthusiasm continued. This was written on the 5th of August, 1996. Now remember, we're still almost a year away. Before the uh, and this will tell you just how enthusiastic the institutional investors, particularly of the United Kingdom, were. The CAPS medium weighting, now the CAPS medium weighting was done by WM Company, and it was a weighting of pension funds. It was the percentage of assets that pension funds had in equity markets around the world. The CAPS medium weighting last September for Asia was 25% against a benchmark weighting of Asia of 6%. A, absolutely shocking. These investors had more money in Asia than they had in America. Now remember what was happening in America at this period. Amazon had come along. Uh, there was a listing for Netscape, and the dot-com boom was underway. And there were f over four times more money in Asia than its benchmark weighting. And if you ever sat down with an investor to suggest why this maybe wasn't the wisest thing, the answer was always the same. Asia's got all this growth. America's ex-growth is for growth. We invest in Asia. And that was as simple as that. Why wouldn't you invest in Asia? It's going to grow faster than America. And what was missed was that it, you're ultimately buying stocks and equities, and America was going to be at the cutting edge of a new type of business. Now, few people saw that at the time. Uh, some people did, uh, but we stuck with the old mantra, which has been wrong throughout economic and financial history, that high economic growth brings you high returns on equities. And it's simply not true, it's never been true, it never will be true, but yet it sells well. And it was very easy to sell these things because even the man on the street knew that things were doing well in Asia, growth was going well, China was emerging. And, uh, they sold well, so they were sold, and this is where we ended up. So this was no ordinary mistake. To have that percentage of uh, British pensions in that is uh, quite spectacular. Of course, the Americans got into the act. Uh, and I used to joke, I actually wrote a piece once uh, saying that if you could find someone wearing a Stetson Stanley, which was the uh, little village where everybody went for a drink around the back of the island, if you find someone wearing a Stetson and Stanley, it would put 100 points on the index. <laughs> because the Americans are coming was one of the great... Uh, the great shouts of the time. But beneath this, there was this cultural problem, that it wasn't actually clear that people who were in receipt of all this capital had the same view on market forces as the people who were putting it in. 
And you heard all the time that they did. There was a thing called Asian values. Asian values and Asian values. And it was a Western imposition upon Asia, which first of all said it was all one thing, which it clearly isn't, given how many countries and people there are there. But also said they had the same values. And it was amazing. The values that were ascribed to these people were almost identical to the values that had been ascribed to North European Protestants by Max Weber in uh, Protestantism and the spirit of capitalism. Uh, and there were some people like that, and there still are. Uh, they're Chinese patriots, and they're all around Asia. They're great businessmen, and they maybe do correspond somewhat to that. But it certainly wasn't the norm. And even these Chinese lived in societies where their position was not, uh, that's, I mean, sustainable it has proved to be, but volatile it also was, because they were a very wealthy minority, often Christian in Muslim countries, such as Indonesia. And a lot of mixed cultures, a lot of attempt to try and hold things together, particularly in Malaysia. So I wanted to read something about the Malaysian system, which gives you some idea of how, tric how tricky this became. You know, it's easy to say the stock market went up, the stock market went down, but behind it, bigger things were, were happening. So this is Malaysia. There were many countries in Asia where the operation of market forces, red and tooth and claw, seemed to me to be incompatible with social political goals. In the boom, investors assumed that so-called Asian values would be supportive of the growth in markets, market forces at the expense of administrative measures. In my opinion, Malaysia was particularly unlikely to permit such forces to operate unfettered given the country's new economic policy that by 1991 had morphed into something called the National Development Policy. These innocuous sounding policies of the Malaysian government were actually major government interventions in the economy to assure that wealth generated would be more equally spread. This policy was seen as necessary following the race riots in Malaysia in 1969 and their aftermath. While there were many causes of tension between the different races in Malaysia, many believed that the greater level of wealth accrued by the Chinese population relative to the Bumi population was a key cause of the bloody chaos in a country that had only gained its independence from the UK in 1957. So there was a new economic policy deliberately aimed at distributing wealth from one economy to the other. Now, if you let market forces uh, have their full sway, this doesn't work. And the man who ran Malaysia knew that, and his name was Mahathir Mohamed, and amazingly, he's still with us. He's probably 150 by now, but he's still going. He still has huge political sway. But he understood this, and I wrote very early on that he was never going to allow this to happen that he would do everything he could to stop this. And that is really where this crisis ended. By September 1998, he imposed capital controls to prevent markets determining prices, to prevent markets allocating wealth, contrary to his new economic policy, which he believed was at the core of social and political cohesion in Malaysia. Nobody cared when the market was going up. Nobody thought about it. The other thing nobody thought about in this great bull market was what the bankruptcy laws of Asia were. Nobody ever questioned the bankruptcy laws. But yet in the stress, when it wasn't clear whether the assets of the company were owned by the owner of equity or debt, we would get calls every day saying, what are the bankruptcy laws of Thailand? And of course we said, well, we just have to ask our analyst about that, and then we phoned a lawyer. <laughs> uh, nobody knew, nobody cared, and suddenly everybody cared. You were investing in different societies. You were investing in different legal systems. But in a bull market, nobody asked questions about that. And then we had the banks. Uh, I wrote this on the 7th of August, 1996, about banks in Asia. But I think it's about banks that are something banks about true generally. It's called badgers, skunks, and killer whales. Uh, the black and white consequences of mispricing for the shareholder depend upon whether they're involved with a badger, a killer whale, or a skunk. A badger is a secretive creature which is daylight, but revels in the dark. Offspring, the good banker is uncomfortable with the prevalent, prevalent banking practices and is cautious, knowing that night follows day. When the inevitable transfer of title to assets begins, the badger bank finds that most of the company's assets are correctly described as such. The killer whale is a large species protected by law and sometimes cosseted in an oceanarium. There are some banks which are so big and so important that their behavior is carefree and their survival and protection ensured by government. The killer whale bank is inevitably underwritten by the public sector as the public good demands. Then there are skunks. Skunks smell. 
as the inevitable transfer of title of assets progresses, there are always skunks. And they were all listed. And their share prices, most of them went to zero, which is one of the reasons that the, the index did so well. So remember, throughout all of this, I'm describing something which seems so obvious. There was luminous insanity that actually, not only was everything good, there was an economic miracle going on because growth was high. So the structural flaws in the society, in the banking system, in the funding of the external accounts, all these things had to be ignored uh, because the markets were going up. Now, I've talked mainly in financial terms, but there was a much greater price going on in Asia during this period. Over 1,000 people in Indonesia died in the Asian financial crisis in the riots that broke out there, mainly because the price of food had gone so high, but also because of the problems with political corruption as well. There were riots in Malaysia. People died in Malaysia as well. So this was more than an economic thing. Uh, and the Suharto regime, which had been there since the mid-1960s, in a morning, effectively the IMF. Now, as we get into the crisis, the IMF get involved in this as well, and that's when we get into the really interesting politics. But before we get there, let me just describe something that was happening. Once again, before the crisis begins, 15th of January, 1997, we've five months away from the crisis. And this is a sort of thing that was literally meat and drink uh, in Indonesia. In fact, this article was called Meat and Drink. According to yesterday's Financial Times, a corporation associated with the first family, this is the Saharto family of Indonesia, will be given the exclusive rights to print labels identifying food as halal. Within the new system, the producers themselves will be given responsibility for certifying that the food has been prepared in the appropriate fashion. This is disturbing Muslim leaders who see their own role in this process as integral. The price per sticker of 10 rupiah also appears on the high side. This is very delicate ground for any capitalist, and certainly for the first family. In 1857, the Indian army was rife with dissent, but the catalyst for the sepoy mutiny was the use of cartridges greased with cow and pig fat that the sepoys had to, dump to bite off the top of the cartridges. Religion, politics and money are a volatile cocktail, and they're increasingly mixed in Indonesia. Uncertainty and risk are rising across the archipelago. Once again, where did I get that story from? The front page of the newspaper, uh, Jakarta Times. And this happened over and over and over again. There were stories on the front page of the newspapers that we ignored. This story, I was told, had nothing to do with finance. Therefore, you should ignore it. The other thing that was on the front page of the newspapers were stories about unlisted companies. Now, in Asia, particularly in, in Southeast Asia, there were lots of big family unlisted companies, and they had listed subsidiaries, I think, the experienced know what happens next. There was lots of wealth transfer between the two, uh, sometimes with asset injections, sometimes by uh, the uh, transfer pricing. We could read about these companies because the journalists would write about them in the newspapers, but because they weren't listed, we didn't talk about them. But it turned out that was pretty important because a lot of the debt was held by the family companies against the shares of the subsidiaries. But we decided to ignore all of that because if it's not listed, it doesn't count. You know, not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. So we just stuck on what we could count and it led us completely astray. We're now getting very close to this bursting. Uh, and of course it bursts on the 2nd of July, 1997, which was an auspicious day in Hong Kong because it was a public holiday because the night before, or two nights before, Hong Kong had been handed back to China. Uh, and I was there the night that Hong Kong was handed back to China. And the, uh, it was handed back by uh, the governor, Prince Charles. And there's a certain yacht that sits in Leith that turned up to take them all away. And we watched it sail out of the harbor. But just a few days before, the British military decided to have a brass band, a brass band parade to celebrate the, uh, the handover. Uh, and I also went to that. I think I was the only person from the broken community going to a marching brass band exhibition. But anyway, I marched up and down. They played all the great classics straight from the British military playbook, but with one exception. There was one song that they played that night. And I remember it distinctly because the hairs were standing up on the back of my neck as they played it just a few days before the handover. 
And I'm not going to sing it, which you'll be glad to know. <laughs> but I'm going to read it out. This is what they played. This was the only song they played that was not a British military marching song. Do you hear the people sing, singing a song of angry men? It is the music of a people who will not be slaves again. When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drums, there's a life about to start when tomorrow comes. Now, for those of you who know Hong Kong, you will know this is the song of protest in Hong Kong. This is the song that's sung by the young protesters when they go out into the streets. Uh, but that is the last gift that was left uh, by the British military as they went away. Were there other any lead indicators that this whole thing is about to fall apart? And the answer is yes, export growth. The whole point about Asia was we were investing and investing and we were going to and so competitive and export. And let me give you in March 97, just before this all begins to unravel, what was happening to export growth that told us that this was not working. The most worrying aspect of the export data from Singapore is what it augurs for the rest of Asia. Japanese import data for February reveals significant year-on-year -year declines of imports from all Asian countries, with the exception of the Philippines. While imports from Singapore declined 28% in February, there was an identical decline in imports from Taiwan and Hong Kong. Japan's imports from South Korea declined 20% and from Thailand 13%. That Japan's imports from Asia should turn so negative was particularly alarming, given that the, gr the growth of Japan's total imports was 10%. Japanese imports from China had grown over 20% a year from 1994 to 1995, and by 1996, they were going at 30% per annum. And therein lies a huge catalyst for this crisis. China had devalued its currency in early 1994. This is now into the middle of 1997. When China devalued, it was a nation. But following Deng Xiaoping's tour of southern China, it had invested it had capital, it mobilized the capital to get rich as glorious was the new phrase for China. And suddenly, it was mobilized people and mobilizing capital at a rate never seen in human history. And we were sitting with these huge account deficits in the rest of Asia, thinking they would grow their way out of it. And this huge competitor was there and destroyed their competitiveness. Now, if they weren't going to grow their way out of these deficits, the only question is, would we continue to fund them? And then it became pretty clear that we weren't going to continue to fund them. There is something else that was going on in this situation, which is often described as the conglomerate. One of the ways you can make a lot of money in the listed sector is to run a company with a piece of highly rated paper, a very high price earnings ratio, and then start to do acquisitions of companies on low PEs. And you issue the high PE paper, you buy low PE, and through the miracles of accounting, you suddenly got earnings growth. And then you have to do another deal and another deal, and this was very prevalent in the United Kingdom in the mid-1960s. But it came to Asia, and this was really powerful in this thing in Asia. So I wrote something on this, and it's, this is, I only read this in Edinburgh, because this is for an Edinburgh audience. It's called The Fate of Mr. William Brodie. And I think just about everybody in this room knows who Mr. William Brodie is, and for those watching on live stream, they will know by the end of it. In 18th century Edinburgh, Deacon William Brodie designed cabinets for the gentry. However, in the evenings, he used his expertise as a locksmith and his inside information to burgle his clients. When finally brought to justice, the deacon suffered the final ignominy of being hang hanged on a gibbet of his own design. Uh, just outside that pub that is now named after him. There's an, often a similar macabre rationality to financial markets. And the price-boosting activities of yesterday, best summed up by the Japanese term Zytec or financial engineering, can become a, root, a tool of dispatch in due course. In particular, the so-called conglomerate game has the brutal inevitability of a Swiss watch. And that's what happened. The price of the paper began to come down. They couldn't do the deals anymore. And the accountants couldn't produce the earnings anymore. And when the earnings weren't produced by the accountants, the price of the paper went down, or the value of the paper went down, and the whole thing uh, went into reverse. So we're now getting close to the end, and still foreign investors aren't selling it. And of course, I've been there for two years telling them to sell, and they won't sell any of it. And when I would go into an office and say, you have to sell this, they said, I can't sell it. You haven't done anything for two years. And by not doing anything in two years, by not going up in two years, it's really, really cheap. 
And everybody would produce thing, these things called PE band charts. So the price earnings ratio is a way you value an equity by develop, dividing its market capitalization by its earnings. Uh, and the lower it gets, the theoretically the cheaper things become. And everybody had these charts showing that the price earnings ratio, the value in Asian equities, was at an all time low. Now, I've just told you that the stock market fell 90% from that all time low. So clearly there was something wrong with the E, the earnings number. And I've explained how that was, that was inflated. So in May 1997, I wrote something called The Day the PE Died, just before uh, this crisis, and took it around the world, trying to persuade people that the PE was an incredibly dangerous way of equities in a, in a asset bubble. Uh, in a banking bubble, uh, and just generally a bubble. But needless to say, it fell on deaf ears. The Thailand in the Asian financial crisis, but I thought Malaysia was spectacularly more uh, out of tune with the real world than Thailand. So I want to read you some of the things that were going on in Thailand on the 20th of June, 1997. We're now just a few days away from this collapse. Earlier this week, Ho Seng Lee announced that it has been awarded a new reclamation and development contract the, the, the reclaimed area is the equivalent of 163 square kilometers, two and a half times the size of Hong Kong Island. While Hong Kong has a population density of 5,677 people per, squ per, per square kilometer, the Malaysians have slightly more elbow room with 58 people per square kilometer. This makes Malaysia about as land short and cost of Ireland, where there are 51 people per, per square kilometer. Should Ireland require a similar development this would involve buying, building an island one size the third of the Isle of Man. Nobody flinched at this project whatsoever. This is what growth, this is what growth is all about, building stuff. The announcement of the new island comes a day after the announcement of another new mega project, the construction of a bridge between Malaysia and Sumatra, not Singapore, Sumatra. Our best estimate of the current schedule of mega projects is as follows. The world's tallest buildings, the Petronas Towers, which were built and are, are spectacular. I'm sure many of you have visited them. The world's longest building, called Giga City, never built. Asia's biggest hydroelectric dam, back British taxpayers. Uh, part of it, not all of it. A new administrative capital, Putrajaya, which was also built. Uh, a new airport, which was also built. Uh, new sports arenas for the Commonwealth Games, built. A new industrial zone and a new multimedia super corridor called Cyber Jaya, which I don't think was built, and a city on stilts off Johor. A city on stilts was never built. Uh, this was all for this tiny little country, and nobody thought any of that was peculiar. And when I wrote this, the head of our Malaysian office tried to get me fired. <laughs> <laughs> because he said I was deterring investment into Malaysia. You're damn right I was deterring Malaysia. Uh. So now we get to this crisis. The Thais devalue the currency. They've borrowed a lot of foreign currency debt. Everybody realizes instantly they're not going to pay it back. And then they look around for everybody else. That's the problem. So now capital starts exiting effectively everywhere. It starts coming out. But the most vulnerable were all down in Southeast Asia because that's where the big current account deficits were. And then within days, they all toppled. The Philippines devalued, uh, Malaysia devalued, Thailand devalued, Indonesia devalued. And really only then did we discover how much foreign currency debt there was, and that they weren't going to be paying it back. And that this wasn't a cyclical problem, this was a structural problem. Uh, the whole thing was probably going to collapse. And then we thought, who lent them all that money? And the answer was the banks of the developed world. And now there was a different question. Was the scale of default, inevitably coming from Asia, going to be big enough to actually wipe out the capital of some developed world banks. This wasn't a new thing. In 1982, an emerging market debt crisis. And it had wiped out the capital, particularly what were then known as the money center banks of New York. And it had created a financial capital uh, crisis in America. And suddenly we were asking a bigger question. Is the Asian financial crisis about to be something bigger? And then something strange happened. It went to North Asia. So that devaluation was on the 2nd of July. It spread quickly to the others in Southeast Asia. And then July went through. And August went through. September went through. And nothing happened in North Asia, Korea and Taiwan. And then something began to happen. In early October 1997, the crisis spread to North Asia. The Hang Seng Index of Hong Kong 
which had reached a new all-time high as recently as August 1997, so after the devaluation in South Asia, was falling rapidly. On the 10th of October, the authorities in Taiwan stepped away from intervening to support the new Taiwan dollar. And suddenly, a North Asian currency had fallen victim to the capital exodus. The currencies of Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia had already devalued, but these were countries running substantial current account deficits. Taiwan was running a current account surplus. That was greater than 3% of GDP, and it had still been forced to devalue its currency. Taiwan had the third highest level of foreign exchange reserves in Asia after Japan and China, almost triple the level of South Korea, and almost double the level of Hong Kong. If a country had such a large current account surplus, some of the largest foreign exchange reserves in the world could then which Asian exchange rate would not devalue in the crisis? The crisis spread. Why did a country with a current account surplus and such huge reserves, why did they devalue the currency? The answer was fairly straightforward. The exodus of capital from Taiwan was pushing up their interest rates. Remember, if you defend your exchange rate in the face of outgoing capital, your interest rates tend to rise. And Taiwan was a grossly overvalued country, partly a, uh, a hangover from the great boom it had had in the 1980s, where the stock market got to 65 times earnings. So they had to let it go because the rising interest rates were bankrupting Taiwan. Suddenly, the Korean exchange rate went. Now, in the history of the Asian financial crisis, actually the greatest thing that happened, or the biggest thing that happened, was Korea. These other economies I've talked about, they're big economies in terms of people. But in terms of the world economy, Korea is a huge export economy. Now, suddenly, Korean exports are incredibly cheap, and they're flooding across the planet, and they're having real permanent impacts on American competitors and competitors everywhere in the world. And that is one of the mechanisms through which this was spreading. A, where the developed world banks themselves bust. And B, how can anybody compete with Korea and other countries on this massive uh, exchange rate? Just to give you some idea of how feverish things had become and how quickly they'd become, uh, I want to tell you about the great Hong Kong cake run. But people remain jittery because in late November 1997, when office drawers were suddenly emptied of cake vouchers. It was a tradition to receive cakes on your birthday in Hong Kong. And to solve the problem of having too much cake on one day, not a problem I ever faced, people <laughs> often presented you with cake coupons. There were to be as much as $40 million of cake coupons circulating, mainly sitting in office drawers in Hong Kong. On 25th of November, a rumor began to circulate that the Saint Honoré cake shop was in financial difficulty. <laughs> the cake run began, and some of the company's 43 outlets had to stay open until midnight to satisfy the run of the coupons. This seems a bit like it's a wonderful life, doesn't it? A run on the tokens used in the whimsy amusement arcades that also developed. Other runs were to follow, and in 1998, one bakery had to close its doors, unable to redeem its coupons in full, and a video rental company was driven to the wall by a run on its coupons. In Hong Kong, money was a serious business, but money and cake were the most serious business of all. Yeah. So there were runs on the banks as well. Uh, those were uh, dealt with, but it was really getting into quite a feverish, feverish state. When historians write about things, things they don't write about are the things that Happen. And the things that didn't happen are actually the most important things. As Sherlock Holmes might say, it's the dog that didn't bark that's important. But what was the important dog that didn't bark in Asia, which everybody told me was going to bark? The valuation of the Chinese exchange rate. And nobody would buy anything. You could talk people blue in the face about the value developing in certain stock markets. They say, well, they'll all be wiped out. China lets the exchange rate go. It's all going to be wiped out anyway. So we're not buying anything. Of course, the Chinese never did the value. And that remains a mystery to this day. Because in early 1998, in the middle of this crisis, they were, they were visited by Larry Summers. And according to a journalist who was there at the time, and I think I can quote him exactly, Larry I don't know if you've ever met Larry Summers, but he doesn't go to his knees very easily. <laughs> He's not that sort of man, begging the Chinese not to devalue. Now, speculation remains that there was a deal done that China wouldn't devalue, and in return it would get something. And this was January 1998, and a few years later it was admitted to the World Trade Organization on incredibly 
simply favourable terms. And there is no evidence, and I want to say this because this is being live streamed, there is no evidence that these two things were related. But something happened in that room. China never devalued, and that was a crucial, important part of this, because had they done so, uh, things would have got much, much worse. Now, the IMF had arrived, and it was already in the Philippines, at its previous bailout mission from the Philippines. It was still there. It arrived in Indonesia. Uh, it arrived in Thailand. And this is a, an issue of great dispute to this very day as to how the terms that were delivered to Asia for its bailout, were they too strict? Did, would, did they work? Were they too strict? And actually, was there something more to it? Was it cultural? Was there the IMF very much backed by the US Treasury? Were they trying to put through a cultural change in Asia? Because as I've already suggested, this business system that they had was a product of its culture. Uh, corruption, yes. Uh, Guangxi, we used to call it before it was called corruption. A more communal approach to life. And the policies that the IMF wanted were completely against that. So there's been a long argument about whether the IMF should have done this or whatever. And I want to give you two opposing sides of that argument. The first one comes from Robert Rubin, who's the man who did it. In, in writing this book, I tried to get people to speak on the record about Robin Rubin's, Robert Rubin's relationships in this, uh, uh, and nobody would. In fact, none of them would even speak off the record. Uh, he was the Secretary of the Treasury under the Democratic Party. And this is what Robert Rubin had to say about what the IMF was doing in Asia and the policies it was forcing upon Asia. If the markets wanted Indonesians to wear blue shirts, would blue shirts become essential to the restoration of confidence? My view was that, by and large, the markets tend to shine a spotlight on real economic problems, although they may exaggerate the importance of those problems at times. In a situation like Indonesia's, foreign investors and creditors might become preoccupied with a symbol, such as the ending of a specific monopoly or the removal of a single corrupt official. But these symbols weren't just blue shirts. In most cases, they related to significant underlying issues, monopolies, corruption, mismanagement, and weak financial systems. So that's the opinion of Ruben as to why this fundamental change in the whole structure of Indonesian business had to be enforced as a price for the bailout. This is the view of Volker, Paul Volcker. Uh, this comes from a book called the, uh, by Paul Bluestein called The Chastening about the involvement of the IMF in Asia. And Volcker said this. What did spice monopolies have to do with restoring financial stability? Volcker demanded of IMF officials when he arrived in Jakarta. They said, you don't understand. It's run by Suharto's son, and if we do anything about it, he will say we're serious, recalled Volcker not entirely convinced of the merits of the funds approach. People have different philosophies, said Volcker. The funds business is macro policy, and that's the stuff you can get changed, how programmatic you can be in things that go into basic cultures and economic structure. Whether that's positive or counterproductive, or it's a continuing issue. That's all I'll say, said Volcker. Now, there is a repercussion from this, because... Asia concluded from this that one of the things it never wanted to do again was to have its political policy, i.e. Sahardo's disappearance, its social policy, its culture dictated from outside. And one of the ways to do that was to, when the, exchange, when the uh, current accounts had improved, was not to allow those exchange rates to appreciate. And this, of course, included China as well. And the consequence of that is they built huge foreign exchange reserves, bought huge amounts of U.S. treasuries, depressed U.S. interest rates, U.S. investors up to buy lots of other stuff. Uh, in my opinion, that is the financial architecture that created the great debt bubble we live with today. It would not have happened if they had resorted to flexible exchange rates. The, the current, uh, surp current account surpluses would have gone up, they would have come down, they would have been like any other country, but they locked in these cheap exchange rates to build this buffer to defend them from Robert Rubin or the ilk and that is the root cause of where we are today. So the consequences from this crisis are cultural. They were manifested in a financial intervention in the exchange rate, uh, but they are cultural. So we're now living through this mess. By the way, at this stage, Asia was on fire. Uh, and when I say on fire, people sort of think, I mean metaphorically, no, literally, Asia was on fire. The great uh, forests of uh, Sumatra had caught on fire. And those forests burn underground. They're a kind of peat-like substance, and they burn on the That all drifted north over Singapore, Malaysia, and some of the air quality was just up. 
It falls. So you were living in this great economic collapse, and you couldn't see the sun for about three months, and it really felt like the world was coming to an end. In this period, Hong Kong lost one of its rising stars, a broking company called Peregrine. Uh, sitting just over there, we have the Peregrine rugby ball from the 1997-1998 Kong Sevens. So what happens at the Hong Kong Sevens is it's usually sponsored by a broking uh, company. They make a little tiny rugby ball as an advert. They send it out to clients. And in May, everybody turns up. So Peregrine did that. But unfortunately, Peregrine didn't make it until May. <laughs> Uh, but the rugby ball is still here to remind us of that. And it, what was the Peregrine Sevens became the CSFB Rugby Sevens. Anyway, this is the day Peregrine fell. So I'm just going to read some Irish poetry, which I think, given the name Peregrine, is rather apt. And this is exactly what it felt like drinking on Lang Kwai Fong the night Peregrine went bust. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Uh, and that was just for brokers in Hong Kong. Imagine if you were a citizen of Indonesia. You really couldn't afford the food. And the land was burning. And people were dying of riots. So this had a huge, huge uh, impact. Now, another thing that brought this to an end, how do we know it was coming to an end? Well, one of the things that happened is the banks agreed standstill agreements. And I think this is really very, very important, because I missed it. I think most of us missed it. We were all looking at these banks who were retreating. But sometimes, and we saw it again in 2000, 2007, 2009, the central bankers pulled the commercial banks into the room and said, look, if you all try to get out, you're all going bust. So let's do an agreement where you don't. And that's exactly what happened in Asia. And that is a key reason why it didn't unfold into a much bigger crisis. And I know one of the men who was involved in that was working on the Emerging Markets Desk at the Federal Reserve. And they get no, absolutely no credit for this. Uh, but there's a long list of people who saved the world. Uh, and I think the central bankers who stopped that exodus from Asia probably played a very large uh, role in it. So the market bottoms. So I go on holiday in the summer of 1998, which is a great year to go on holiday because the World Cup is on in, in France. So I go to watch Scotland lose to Brazil. Uh, it's an old tradition. I like to go and watch Scotland lose against Brazil because I've watched them lose in uh, 1990 in Italia as well. Uh, and then I come back and I'm wildly optimistic about the outlook for Asian equities. Most people said that's because I'd had too good a holiday. Uh, but I just wonder, this is the 14th of July. Remember, the market bottoms on the 3rd of September. Uh, and, and I'm going to read this and not sing it. If anybody feels like they can sing it, please do so. Consumers with bonuses, credit cards flinging, new cars leaving showrooms and tills that are ringing, cheap loans for property, all bankers sing. These are a few of those cyclical things. When the banks bust, when machines rust, when I'm feeling bad, I picture a few of these cyclical things, and then I don't feel so bad. Uh, so you can see why people thought I'd gone slightly insane after, after a couple of weeks in Bordeaux. Uh, so I thought it was coming to an end. No, it didn't end then. The market fell for three weeks. It's not in this book because I wanted to protect the innocent, but I got a, a fax. There were faxes in those days from a client with a chart from when I called the bottom of the market to September the 3rd. He sent this on the day the market was the CLSA, called bottom of Asian stock market, complete total F up, congratulations, and signed his name at the bottom of it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the day the stock market bottomed. Uh, so that was just three weeks. Uh, it was a three weeks that were incredibly painful, uh, but ultimately, of course, it worked out very well. Now, we're getting close to the end. You'll be glad to know I did tell you this is the first time I've lectured at the Library of Mistakes and now you know why because it go on a little bit longer. Uh, great surprise then, not a surprise to me, was that Mahathir Mohammed imposed capital controls, exchange controls in Malaysia. Now remember going into this, a quarter of all your money was in Malaysia because that was effectively the index and now you couldn't get it out. So I started getting phone calls from people saying, how do we get our money out of Malaysia? And I'm saying, you can't. Saying, well, you know, there's no way to get your money out of Malaysia. No, there's no way to get your money out of Malaysia. <laughs> So that's just life. Uh, I wrote that up, and sadly, the piece I wrote up was read out in the Malaysian parliament, which is eight years I couldn't return to Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> so I just read a little bit of this report that was read out in Malaysia. It's called Lament for the Jury. Well, this doesn't mean anything unless you know what a Jurian is. Who knows what a Jurian is? Yeah, okay. So a Jurian looks a little bit like a pineapple, smells like a sewer. A durian smells like a sewer. 
And in most places in Asia, you're not allowed to take them onto airplanes, for instance. You're not allowed to have them in hotel rooms because the smell is so bad. And the thing about Malaysia, the one reason it got so much capital, it was in two MSCI indices. It was in the developed world index and the American market index. I mean, who knows how these things happen, but it was in both. Through an accident of history, the MSCI bequeathed upon you a lower cost of capital than most nations could dream of. With such a bequest, it was easy to challenge the alleged efficiency of markets. Like Sydney, Dallas, Tokyo, and other stockyards, you took the opportunity to think big where the cost of capital was small. In the Malay Dilemma, Ms. Mahathir's book on the new economic policy, you give us the blueprint for the creative and indestructive dynamics of wealth redistribution through an equity market. On the way up, it worked with the deadly precision of a Swiss watch, predictable and beautiful and so easy to understand. Now fashion has changed. Now to foreigners, you are like your much misunderstood durian. Prickly on the outside and stinking in the middle. <laughs> so when does Guangxi, or connections, become capitalism? When share prices decline. So somebody read it out in Parliament, and you can see that the ruling party is not happy to be, see Malaysia called the Durian Republic. You'll be glad to know I'm about to finish. What was the legacy from all of this? Well, in October 1998, the IMF met in Washington, D.C., and they were terrified because now Russia had defaulted. The impacts for this were running through the world. Russia defaulted. Russia was a nuclear state. I was told all the time by Russian bonds, nuclear states never default. Oh, yes, they do, and yes, they did. It rolled on to Brazil, and just a few months after this, Brazil devalued. Its impact in Argentina was to create what they call a sort of Great Depression, and four years of trying to defend the exchange rate it collapsed anyway after this great, horrible depression. So the IMF thought we were heading into uh, a new Great Depression. Uh, Bill Clinton did a speech, and this, I think, is very informative about the world we live in today, about what had to be done urgently in September, October 1998, if we were going to sort this out. This is Clinton speaking. Creating a global financial architecture for the 21st century, promoting national economic reform, making certain social protections are in place, encouraging democracy and dem democratic participation in international institutions. These are ambitious goals. To meet these challenges, I have asked the finance ministers and central banks of the world's leading economies and the world's most important emerging markets to recommend the next steps. There is no task more urgent for the future of our people. For at stake is more than the spread of free markets, more than the integration of the global economy. The forces behind the global economy are also those that deepen liberty, the free flow of ideas and information, open borders and easy travel, the rule of law, fair and even-handed enforcement, protection for consumers, a skilled and educated workforce. Each of these things matter, not only to the wealth of nations, but to the health of nations. If citizens tire of waiting for democracy and free markets to deliver a better life for themselves and their children, there is a risk that democracy and free markets, instead of continuing to thrive together, will shrivel together. Nothing was done. Greenspan reduction in interest rates sparked a much more rapid economic improvement than the makers of the IMF in the world is coming to an end mode could have expected. The hard bargaining to build Clinton's Bretton Woods for the next millennium never took place. As stability returned, the need to make difficult political decisions could be delayed. What remained was a new global financial architecture based upon exchange rate policy decisions taken in Asia that for two decades produced surpluses that moved jobs from west to east, depressed inflation and interest rates, and directly led to the biggest increase in leverage the world has ever seen. And that is why the Asian financial crisis is important, because it led to those imbalances. And in my opinion, it means that we end up much more like North Asia. We simply cannot allow, or policymakers cannot allow markets to in the future. They need to inflate away these debts. And to some of the policies of China, Korea, or Japan. And the consequence of the Asian financial crisis is something called financial repression. And as I have promised my publisher, that will be the subject of the next book. Thank you. So with my lovely assistant, Charles, we are going to, uh, I'm going to answer some questions. I'm going to put the lights up a bit as well, just for the... Uh, So, yep, just 
Charles, you select who's going to get it. Thank you very much. That was um, a tour de force, um, and um, particularly interesting for me because I was a journalist in Asia at the time, although I was completely isolated from it because I was working in Vietnam, and of course the Vietnamese dong was non-convertible. So none of what you were describing really washed up on Vietnamese shores. But I just wanted to ask, you talk a lot about um, mis mispricing of risk, essentially, misperceptions, c complete failure to understand correlations between equity markets and growth and so on and so forth. One of the things we were told after the end of the Asian financial crisis is that um, Sovereign, sovereigns got their act together on debt, they got their act together on exchange rate policy, and so on and so forth. Fast forward, the big difference now really is China, in terms of the mix and the dynamic. What's the big lesson that we collectively have perhaps still not f understood about potentially the next Asian financial crisis and where it may come from? How do you see that? So I think it's October 1998. Taiwan. So Taiwan had a current account surplus and had huge reserves and had to devalue its exchange rate because its debt, domestic debt to GDP ratio was so high. And as capital was actually it was pushing up interest rates. Now these are ex almost exactly the same numbers for China. China's current account surplus is incredibly volatile at the minute because of COVID as is everybody else's, but the surplus is small. It obviously has huge foreign exchange reserves. But we are ripping capital out of China at a pretty ferocious rate. I say we, I mean portfolio investors. That is currently done at the volition and will of the portfolio investor. But it could, of course, become a legal priority to remove capital from China. The vast bulk of this two trillion US dollars that rests in security in Renminbi is in the bond market. So foreign investors are funding the Chinese Communist Party to do well. Well, if they get involved in a Ukraine, Will we be allowed to fund them going forward? So there are two ways in which this can become a problem. Choose to remove their capital from China, and you know, many people are doing that in the equity market as well because they're concerned about common prosperity and uh, Xi's policies that may undermine corporate profits, but it can become more than just a choice and a free will. It could be compelled. I think that will put upward pressure on Chinese interest rates. The debt to GDP ratio of China is 289%, which is roughly the same as America. So outrageous. But the private sector debt service ratio of China, so that's the total amount of private sector income used to service debt, is about 10%. But actually, in the crisis, which is really when we get this data, if you happen to have a private sector debt service ratio around 20% or more and interest rates go up, this has been a good guide, not infallible, but a good guide to when you're headed for a, a crisis. So I would argue there are a, humor, I mean, a huge number of consequences of this, but just for the moment, I would focus on China and the exodus of capital. It's got a high debt to GDP ratio. It's got falling residential property price. That is the key collateral for any financial system. And if it was any other economy in the world, I think we'd be talking about the prospects of a debt deflation. And I think that's what China faces. So instead, I think they'll do a Taiwan and they'll let the currency float. So it's my job to forecast the future, and I do that with uh, varying degrees of accuracy. I have some clients here who can vouch for this, uh, but that's my forecast, that it means that we're going to see an October 98 for China. And you'll know in the last couple of weeks, Chinese currency has been a bit weak. So we shall see if the future holds a flexible Chinese exchange rate. And let's face it, one day it's going to be flexible. You can't have the second biggest the world managing its currency relative to somebody else. If, if Australia can have a floating currency, if Canada can have a floating currency, then China will get there. And the only question is when. So I think that's the most important current lesson from the Asian financial crisis. Charles, can you just check the microphone? I think yeah, it went off there. Yeah,
Yeah, I'll just re I'll just repeat the question. So the question is, how does this relate to Japan? Where currently we see uh, a weak yen, which actually was going on during this Asian crisis, uh, but specifically the questioner points to yield curve control in Japan and the role of yield curve control. So I, I first need to explain what yield curve control is, which is a central bank determines what the yields right across the interest rate uh, spectrum will be, one year, two years, three years, four years, and 10 years, and then commits itself to buying without limit the bonds, the government bonds of that country to maintain the yields at this level. And it's not new. Uh, it was done by the Americans from January 1942 to sometime in 1951 in wartime conditions. And it was done to provide cheap finance for a government to, to win a war. And of course, it kept going for six years after the war. And the reason it kept going is that the debt to GDP levels at the end of the war were so astronomically high that you simply couldn't contemplate allowing interest rates to go to that level. And Patrick, that's exactly why the Japan is uh, embarking upon this policy. Its debt to GDP ratio was so high, it simply can't live with higher nominal rates. But herein lies a problem. The debt the ratio of Japan is 411%, so it is by far and away the best in the world. But France is 370%. Uh, the United Kingdom is 300%. So this yield curve control mechanism is probably coming to a bond market near you. Uh, and these numbers are higher than World War II. You often see the press discuss statistics for debt to GDP, but they use the government debt to GDP number. They don't use the total debt to GDP number, that would be the government, the household sector, and the non-financial corporates. When you put those together, most countries, most of the countries in the world have got more debt to GDP than they had at the end of World War II. So in my opinion, Japan's gone first. Uh, the Eurozone will be next. Uh, I think the United Kingdom probably not too far behind, and this will move eventually to America. And you know, as you know, this is the financial repression that I discussed earlier. It leads you into all sorts of rabbit holes, trying to prevent people arbitraging you uh, and putting capital somewhere where you don't want it when you want them to put it into the bond market. And we live with that from 1979 to 1979. Uh, and this inevitably, eventually, and it took a while, led to our bankruptcy in 1976. So there are, there's a price for this. It's a very high price by savers. But that's the system that we're into. So where Japan has led, I think, is where we are ultimately in the developed world uh, all going. So not really a lesson of the Asian financial crisis, but one thing to point out is that weak yen. The yen went from 80 in the first quarter of 1994 to 148 in around September 1998. And that's a strong dollar. A weak yen is a strong dollar. And this, the catalyst for this in Asia was partly that strong dollar because the Asians tried to follow that dollar up. They were managing against the dollar. Uh, it tightened liquidity. So we're living with that today. Uh, if the dollar continues to rise, it just makes problems even worse for those, particularly those who've borrowed in dollars, if they use those dollars to finance activity in their local currency. So this thing in Japan could quite quickly, if it keeps going, bring more economic pain elsewhere. I would focus on China again. It's China that's going to have the main problem with, with a very weak yen. Uh, because of the situation it's in, and because it does have a relative number, a relative a large amount of competition uh, with Japan. Thanks, Russell. I, I So, so, so the question was, uh, is if China does go for a devalued renminbi, will they be allowed to reap the benefits of that? And the benefits of that are really you know, hyper-competitiveness. So the answer has to be no. And uh, we will uh, slap, we, <laughs> the developed world will put tariffs on China should it do that. Because it's simply, we can't live with that. It was difficult enough to live with it in 1994. And China was a tiny economy in 1994. It's now the second biggest economy in the world. So it leads inevitably to tariffs. But I think given the recent relationships between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, China's kind of just shrugged its shoulders and say, look, it's going to happen anyway, so let's get on with it. I mean, I think that is the important thing that's just happened here. China has lived with the prospect of being besieged, at least since 2018, arguably since the Asian pivot by Obama, which I think was 2014, much earlier on. But 2018, 
uh, a man called Mike Pence gave a speech at the Hudson Institute in October where he said that China was the enemy. China had to be contained and gave lots of reasons why China, why we should do that. Europe didn't join in until two weeks ago when the finance minister of Germany, Christian Lindner, gave a almost identical speech about the risk of China, about its ideological competition and how we had to do everything to so I think China's kind of shrugging its shoulders and saying, look, they're going to besiege us anyway. So let's just get on with it. So I think that's another reason why they might move to this place. They didn't, who wants to do that if it's going to annoy all your trading partners? But how can the trading partners be even more annoyed than they currently are? Uh, and if you want a good description of that, it's called friend shoring, which was a new term to me. But Janet Yellen, who's the current Secretary of the Treasury, has described a policy called friend shoring. And what that means is you only buy things from your friends. She then went on to give a list of things that may not be friends. Uh, it's a very short list. Uh, and actually, I don't even think it included Russia. It just included China. And she didn't categorically say that China was a friend. But she said that it was sort of havering on the edge of being a friend or not being a friend. So I think it's clearly tipping over the other way. So the, the consequences for China from this are big. But the, 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 the alignment with Russia I think they've just decided we, we have to get on with it now because clearly they're going to besiege us. But besieging is a very uh, emotive term, but I'm trying to see it from a Chinese perspective. And I think you have to try and look. I, one of my hobbies is reading the history of sieges. I'm a cheery sort of individual. And if you, if you read the history of sieges, you know what the besieged do. You can just, for the last four years, you can, you can tell what Xi's going to do because he's a man who believes and there are lots of things I think you can forecast that he will, he will now do. But moving that currency is not as big a deal as it, as it would have been because he already feels that the tariffs are coming or in this anyway. Uh, and he's being boxed in. So I think they'll take the risk. But yeah, absolutely. We ostracize them from the global trading regime. Uh, just by all the businesses being killed by Chinese competition. Because suddenly they're going to be in high demand. Uh, and that's what we're doing. Ma uh, Macron is building an industrial policy for France. He's going to get the French banks to fund it. And that industrial policy will be all the things that have gone for China. So the world, obviously, the most important thing that's happening in the world is people are being murdered in Ukraine. Uh, but there's a bigger shift underway. And I think a movement in that exchange rate is part of it. Uh, the question was, would I take all my capital out of Taiwan? Not, not necessarily. I don't believe that China will invade Taiwan, for instance. Can. So not particularly. I don't know whether to say this on live stream, but the great threat to China is the chips from Taiwan. And if you can't have them, there would be an incentive to destroy them. But we should move to the next question at that stage, please. I'm just looking at my um, my phone, and the, the US two year is at 2.7%, and futures today are talking about 10, 25 bit rises. Absolutely extraordinary. And that's real money, people skinning the game. It's not a forecast, it's, it's people betting. Yeah. So the, the financial markets in the state seem to say it's just an autonomous, we don't care about the rest of the world. Who, who's going to blink? Is, 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 are they getting that wrong with that aggressive Fed hiking? Or will the Europeans and the Japanese fold and have to follow up at speed? Something's got to break because that's, it looks insane to me at the minute. Yeah, well, well, at some stage we're going to start talking about the Asian financial crisis again. <laughs> uh, the Fed won't do that. They can't do that. It's jaw jaw, not war war. So. I'm not saying they won't do something, but they will back down. Debt levels are too high. We are living in a world of emergencies. There is a national defense emergency. There's a health emergency. There's an inequality emergency. There's a climate emergency. And the idea that we get an interest rate emergency on top of that is not going to happen politically. So the Fed believes it can talk the markets into something. And it spent years talking, sometimes successfully, markets into anything. But it isn't going to do that. Force a solvency emergency on these international emergencies. What we get is emergency finance. You'll see on the walls of this Augusta institution some adverts for emergency finance. They're called war bonds. 
sold at yields way below the rate of inflation, particularly real inflation, if one was seeking to buy food on the black market as opposed to ration coupons. And emergency finance comes with emergencies. And emergency finance does not submit itself to high interest rates and adding crisis onto the other crisis. So the Fed will not do it. Thanks very much. Um, as I understand, you've argued that the Asian financial crisis led to the financialization of the global economy through essentially the Bernanke savings club yep. argument. I mean, there are other arguments around the decline in the trend decline in interest rates since the early 80s, uh, which some people like Goodhart have ascribed to slowdown in productivity growth. Just speak louder. So, I suppose part one, what can you put on that good heart argument around the demographics and how that might have been influenced in saving and bringing down interest rates? Part two, assuming you put any weight on it, you've argued that we're expecting financial crisis, financial crisis in the Western economies. Can governments actually? Yeah, so, so you probably know Goodhart is saying that we'll get more inflation and interest rates because of dem demography. So it's called the, he's written a book with uh, Pradhan called the great, the great Demographic Reversal, which is a great read. Uh, even the person who came up with the theory thinks there's something fundamental in demography that drives prices up. And it's really very simple. The, the least productive thing a young person can do is to look after an old person. And that's one of the fundamental reasons why you get inflation. Uh, but anyway, back to the first part of the question. Uh, there is no such thing as the Asian savings block. It's complete nonsense. All there was, was an Asian currency manipulation. Without it, there would never have been a savings block. What would have happened is they would have run surpluses, their exchange rates would have gone up, and the surpluses would have disappeared. David Hume told us that quite a long time ago. They wouldn't let the currencies go up. So it was the decision to run those policies that did create this huge surplus, which was exported, and did all the things that he said it was doing, it was the result of a currency policy, not a savings glut. The savings glut, if you like, resulted from the currency policy. So that's the, that's the problem. We didn't work out that in 1990. We didn't work out a financial intervention, and that savings glut called was actually just a currency manipulation. So I do believe that was the fundamental reason for low inflation, also the financial inflation of the economy, which you, which you mentioned. We created a huge amount of financial capital which didn't build corporate capital, uh, which is a kind of a different presentation of the financial cycle. Uh, all, that corporate, all that corporate capital has been built in China. We had huge financial capital, so what did we do with it? We geared the hell out of everything. That's called financial engineering. Now, in the world that I'm looking at, and we've slightly discussed the future, we have to redirect that financial capital into building corporate capital, steel, steel chemicals, all that went to China. If you begin to extract that financial to the creation of corporate capital, then the valuation of financial assets comes down. But some companies will do spectacularly well. So our role was to that decision in 1990, followed by the rest of Asia. And of course, there are other causes. That was the cause of it. Volker used to call this the, the uh, hybrid system. And he knew where it was going and what was going to happen. Uh, but we just kind of ignored him. And why did we ignore him? Because so many people made so much money out of gearing the hell out of everything. And you know what? They were politically powerful. They are politically powerful. And it's going to take another shot to end that particular uh, form of uh, financial engineering. But it's coming for all that. And all that is coming yet for all that. I think there's time for If there is one more question, Charles, we'll take one question. Uh, because I'm getting thirsty. You're going to have to shut. It's just not working. Uh, sure. So oh, it's working now. <laughs> <laughs> so you talk about financial repression. I know it's the title of your next book, so I'm running out of time. But, but it's interesting that financial repression is occurring today in some regulated institutions. You know, you're 
if your bank or pension fund with sort of fixed asset allocation, yeah. you're forced to buy an economic assets. But a lot of Yeah. So, so the question, because the microphone's on that blink again, is uh, how do you run a repression? How do you get people out of all the attractive assets and into the unattractive assets? <laughs> or uh, as I said, how do you get them into the king fixed interest securities? Uh, I used to be on the board of a company called Scottish Investment Trust, and in World War II, the chairman of the Scottish Investment Trust was flown, I think he flew in a, in a bomber to Canada and in Canada, he picked up the securities, the equity securities that were owned by British institutions, but they weren't owned by British institutions anymore because they were forced to swap those for British government bonds. Uh, and the reason that the British government wanted those securities is they were realizable for dollars. And one of the things you could do with dollars was buy armaments. Now, I'm not suggesting we're gonna get to that stage, but in its extreme form, that's how it works. You have to force institutions to own government and by definition, if you're doing that, you're forcing them to sell something. Well, you can do it in a rather dramatic fashion and give it all to Carlisle Gifford. Uh, or you can do it in a less dramatic fashion and point out that it's already happening. For some institutions, it's already happening. So we ramp that up. Now, I've actually just done some research on that for my clients looking at America, trying to find it. Well, where is this huge pot of money, which isn't already in government bonds? Uh, private sector pension schemes in the US. They've got $12 trillion worth of assets and 4% of government bonds. Are plenty of pools of money that can be forced to bond sales, and then you are forcing them to sell tech. You're forcing them to sell what they own, and what they own is what's big in the index, and what's big in the index is tech. So you don't say, by the way, you must sell tech. You say you must buy government bonds, uh, and by doing that, we change the system. Uh, and then it becomes it comes a giant game of whack-a-mole, where you're rushing your capital around trying to arbitrage or being a polite word, uh, in the post-World War II period, arbitrage was, uh, was the chap in Centrinians who turned up with a coat selling cigarettes. You know, breaking the rules. That's what arbitrage is in that situation. So you arbitrage and the government chases you around with new regulations. One of the people who's uh, interested in this library is threatening to donate to me something he took out of the Bank of England in 1979, which is the book with all the regulations on exchange controls, which is a thousand pages long. It didn't start with a thousand pages long. It started with something very simple. And then gradually we had to start whacking the mode and stopping. So a few minute pres uh, presentation on financial repression. But that's how it works. Forcing someone to buy something means you're forcing them to sell something. And yes, it will be equities. But some equities are going to do spectacularly well in a financial repression. And maybe we just call them old economy. Old economy reminds me of brewing and reminds me that this presentation has to come to an end. <laughs> <laughs>